Give it up for my good friend Hilmi, <laughs> game designer and lecturer. Can I have a clicker? Yes, you can have the clicker. Yay! Uh, Tails on the dark side. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Very dark. Hi guys, uh, my name is Hilmi Abdurrahim. I've been lecturing on game development and multiple software for over 10 years. I started lecturing in 1998 when I, went, I joined university when I was a student. I'm trying not to name names, uh, that's decided not to do so. Uh, I'm sharing anecdotes about what happened uh, when I was learning how to teach and the strange things I noticed handling local higher education. So that's one. How I'm going to tell my experience by going through five kinds of students that I noticed and they are very unusual to me because I did my education overseas. Uh, I did a degree in computer science in America, Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee. And I came back and I tried to apply the way I learned there here. And I noticed how somehow some things just don't fit. So I'm going to present to you the kind of students that crop up, that maybe question how education actually works. The first one are the polite ones. <laughs> I'm not sure what, if you know what I mean, but let's move on. So basically, I was in an art faculty where I can hang out with students and as they draw, I learn to draw with them, I discuss with them, sometimes they come up to me, sir, I have a question, and so on. So, students like this are very normal. They come up with questions, sir, how do you do this in Photoshop, get here, you do this, and so on. So there's one time around 11 p.m., I was hanging around the art studio, and one student came up this month, sir, I have a question. The question was, what's the procedure for getting student medical attention outside? So he said it with a smile, with no sense of uh, stress anyway. So I just answered, well, OK, probably have to call someone in the hostel, get paper form, sign it, and so on. Is that it? Yeah, sure. I was 24. I was just about fresh from university, so technically I was dumb. <laughs> Getting smarter, but still dumb, but I heard this question, thought in my head, it's 11 p.m. thinking, why did you ask that question? <laughs> so of course, I looked at it. Uh, wait a minute. Why did you ask that question? And he said the answer, same face, smiling face, no stress whatsoever. Oh, uh, a friend of mine got hurt outside and tried to figure out how to get her to the hospital. <laughs> I blew up. <laughs> because if he didn't say that, I wouldn't know the urgency of the situation. So I basically called around, uh, asked for help and so on. So we got a whole entourage, two girls carrying one girl over to a car to the hospital, two girls escorting us, me carrying the phone to make sure that she can get into the hospital, and the friend and the boyfriend of the girlfriend following us all along. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out much bigger than anticipated, and because of this, I'll always remember this face. <laughs> because it tells me that what you see on a person's face, especially in a student, may not be what they're thinking inside. <laughs> so, the problem with lecturing locally is that for some reason, our students are conditioned to not give feedback. <laughs> you know, it's like difficult to say, I asked a question, nobody answered. Do you have any questions? No. <laughs> they might say feedback. This is feedback. I'm okay with students like this, because I know what he's thinking. He's bored, he doesn't listen, and he say, hey man, you okay? What's your problem? Can I talk to you and so on? I know what he's thinking, so I can intercept, I can ask. This scares me. <laughs> because he looks like he's paying attention, but he could be, I have no idea what he's saying. I'm going to pretend I understand what he's talking about. <laughs> the thing is, this is not limited to classrooms or to just Malaysia. Autodesk do regular show events where they have a new version of software. They will do regular events in restaurants, tell people this is what the new features are. There was one speaker doing a master class in Malaysia where he presented how 2D Studio Max works and he says to everyone after one hour, do you have any questions? Quietness. And then he says, wow, I thought Singapore was quiet. <laughs> so yes, it seems to be a regional problem. <laughs> so the thing is, I enjoyed my stay uh, in the West. When I went to class in the West, there was a lot of discussion. We were encouraged to speak, discuss, debate, fight politely, putting each other. But the basic idea is that you're supposed to talk and communicate one another. And I wanted to do that with my students. I wanted them to converse with me. I wanted to know what are the problems. I wanted them to understand, please talk to me. And there were very definite obstacles. What I noticed is that when I started uh, in university, this is what I want. 
I think friends are an accepting program. So basically, I assume, okay, I'm more executive now, I'm teaching people, let's press formally and teach people. Went to class, and it was two months into class before someone actually dared to say something. What they told me after they were with me was that I scared them. <laughs> that outfit scared them. So and it eventually evolved over time to something more casual, like what you see here. And it's deliberate. In universities, there are rules about dress codes or how we should dress formally to other students. I had to ignore it because my priority is to make sure students are comfortable talking to me, so I have to dress down. I have to literally come up with a persona that is non offensive so that students are willing to speak to me. The thing is, uh, this is very interesting because the student Paul Graham, he runs a, a VC in US called White Combinator. He writes a lot about geek culture. And what he points out here is that among geeks and nerds, there is a tendency for people to dress informally. They consistently dress informally, not because they don't want to dress well. They do. But to them, the idea of dressing informally is a way to defend themselves against stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> because, I tell you to Paul Graham, you may agree or disagree, but I like the way he puts it. Because the idea here is that when people dress up, it's to make up for a lack of knowledge or authority or the ability to tell you what is actually right. That is why he said it's not considered places that the people in corporate you don't like are called suits. So this is what I base my ideas on, so I dress down myself. So I deliberately make myself informal so that students are more willing to speak up, not from script. Some people speak up, they anticipate what they think I want to hear, and they say that I don't want that. I want to hear people speak not from script. So that's why I handle one type of students. Uh, they will come back later, uh, go on. Then I meet the other type of students. And by the way, I love these guys. I love them a lot. The example I bring is one guy who stood up in the middle of us and said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I love this guy. <laughs> I do, because I spent years having quiet classes, and this guy just stood up and challenged me, like, oh my god, this guy just <laughs> So, a little background about the degree program they're in. This is a game development program that is actually a combined class between uh, faculty IT and faculty of creative multimedia. media. So, one faculty handles programming classes, another faculty handles art classes, the idea that was moved at that, they will combine classes together so that students will do both parts and create game classes. I came in because when I did my research on creating this course, I realized that they need separate classes on creating game design knowledge, so that's what I taught these students. What happened eventually was that since these courses are being shared, none of the faculties actually wanted to take responsibility over the students. They would sign up with one faculty, but they won't say that these students are actually directed under faculty. So, which leads to one student who tell me with a smile, we're masters. <laughs> and he said it politely, of course, but we know what he means. <laughs> so, in this process, basically students will enter the university, they go to a one-year foundation program, and then they go to regular programming courses. So it will take them one year and two semesters before they actually meet me which is the first time they would handle, sorry, they would encounter a specific game development class. Which is why I'm wondering, why does he hate me? <laughs> he made it very, very personal. I actually like him because when he argues, he was uh, very factual, very passionate, and I can argue facts over facts, I can debate with him. In fact, I deliberately encourage him. I would basically put, I had to put a person saying that, okay, I understand your point, let me tell you what counterpoints are, and yada, yada, and so on, because I want to encourage him to keep talking. But I do sense that he has a huge chip on his shoulder. It felt personal, and I don't know why. Now, the thing is, uh, some lecturers would probably try to put the guy down, because his attitude could be considered disruptive. <coughs> I wanted to encourage him. Because he wasn't disruptive, he was actually helping to educate the class by giving his point of view, and his points were really, really good. So I basically tolerated him. There were times where he basically refused to do assignments. I would describe an assignment to class, and he would say, this is stupid, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so the thing is, of course I could penalize him for that, but then again, this is something I made up my mind a long time ago when I started teaching. I'm not going to penalize people on attitudes. My job as a lecturer is to guide them to know something. 
how they learn it is actually up to them. I have no control over that. If I start thinking that I have control over how they learn, I'm going to start yelling at them, punishing them, berating and degrading them. No, I can't do that. My only authority is the grades they earn. So that's what I told him. Okay, dude? This assignment is worth 10% of your grades. If you, do, if you don't do this, you're not getting 20%. Are you okay with that? He says, yes. We're cool. <laughs> so, and we move on to the second semester where the class is a little different. The first semester, the class is almost theoretical. Second semester with the students, it's more practical. So I had six assignments. They're all very similar. They're all development assignments. And I'm, I had several rules. One, I will drop two bottom scores. They can choose to do all six assignments, and they can choose to drop the two lowest bottom scores that only take four scores. Which means, if they do the first four and they get the best score, they don't have to do the last two assignments. Secondly, you present the assignment to everyone in class. It's not something that's shown to me, you show it to me and everyone. Thirdly, you are graded instantly in front of everyone. <laughs> Okay, what you need to know is that uh, since I'm creating the game development classes, I'm trying to figure out what is the best way to teach people, what is the best way to get into the game development. And I was in the creative multimedia faculty. And among artists, they believe in portfolios. What I realized that artists are very confident with themselves. They know what their value is, they know what they can do, and it comes out to be able to show exactly what they can do. The problem with programs is abstract. You can have really good code, but to some of code, it's mostly googly goop. <laughs> and a program can run well and pop up one answer, and you don't even know why it runs well. <laughs> so I crafted the assignment so that the results are visual. If it runs well, it fulfills the requirements, it can be seen, and everyone can see it. And if it works properly, they can keep it and show it to future employers as part of their portfolio. So this is a different way. I'm telling programmers to create a portfolio. So, what I do is that for every assignment, I have a set of requirements. They're basically requirements that says that if you do this much, you get two points, do this much, you get three points. So if they do average, you get five points. They do something which is about medium in difficulty, they get up to six points. If they do something which is exceptional, then they get ten points. And basically, that's the same for all the assignments. We create it four times. Uh, run some of these numbers to get over 100%. The first assignment given was to create a bouncing ball. A very simple uh, programming uh, principle where you have one ball and you simply translate the motion so that it moves as if it's bouncing. So you get extra score if it moves, bounces realistically. Extra points if you bounce it against the wall. Top marks if you manage to bounce it off an angle. Because I know that to program a ball to bounce off an angle that's not a right angle takes some extra calculation. It's the first programming assignment, so okay, let's give it something easy. So that student, the difficult student, handed in a program that went beyond by requirements. It fulfilled all the requirements, but he had balls bouncing off the <laughs> Balls. <laughs> how else would I pronounce it? Well. <laughs> Take it how we like it. <laughs> so, bouncing spiritual objects <laughs> from curves, meaning that his program actually calculates the trajectory of the bouncing spiritual object <laughs> from any point of the curve. He basically showed a much higher skill in programming than the other students. And the thing is, I give him A because I agree with students that I give you these requirements. You fulfill these requirements, you get top marks. He did. He went overboard, but he fulfilled the requirements. He said, okay, you, you got an A. I only found out this later. Most of the students in the class were very surprised I did not penalize him for going beyond the requirements. This didn't make sense to me back then, but this is what they thought. And this actually implies why are they thinking regarding lectures in universities. So the classes went on, and I noticed a change in dynamic. What happened was because that student actually showed what he did to others, the others basically started looking up to him, started asking what to do, started to compete with him, and in other words, he became a benchmark. And as the assignments went on, he showed what he could do. He was happy to show his capability, and the others are trying to catch up with him. So it became a very positive, competitive class. What happened eventually was that he fulfilled the first four assignments easily. It was very noticeable that the man is a very, very, very good programmer. 
And I told him, okay, you fulfill the first four assignments. You don't need to do the last two assignments. You can come to class, you can watch them, but you don't really need to. So it's okay, I'll just come and watch. He was basically became more congenial as class goes by. He's not argumentative anymore. He was happy to be in this class. <laughs> but I still don't know why he's angry. Wait a moment. So I knew that he was an awesome programmer. Now, as a lecturer uh, in the university, I have certain rights. At the end of the semester, I can go through the grades of the students for under my, uh, under my class, including the other classes that a student takes. So I check on his grades. And I found out that in the same semester when he was doing awesomely in my class, he got a C class in object oriented programming. <laughs> and I'm thinking, something's funny here. <laughs> I know he's good. I know he understood the principle of object programming because I learned that in my university. I knew he applied it. And he did badly here. So I'm wondering what's going on. So for the first time ever, I actually called him up and I asked him, dude. I have the right to check your grades. I see that C plus object of programming. That's not supposed to happen. What happened? So he told me why. And I discussed it with other students as well. And it turns out that there is a very general problem with the course itself. What happened was that when it went through the programming classes, a majority of the class grade is determined by exams. <laughs> now, programming is a craft. You actually start implementing solutions. OK. <laughs> Okay. I'm currently ranked number seven in Sweden as software developers. Okay. Among all software developers. I can't even remember what I did yesterday. Uh -huh. To ask me to do any of that stuff is like, it's, there's no way I can uh -huh. do that. Uh -huh. If you want me to do the assignment on the bouncy spherical stuff, mm -hmm. no problem. Right. But to do that, <laughs> you're gonna ask. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> that is. I don't know about the other six people above me. Maybe they know how to memorize. I don't know. <laughs> but I would say me. I don't know. I okay. Couldn't, I couldn't do it. And you have exactly summarized the last point there, because exams are memory based and. I can tell you the exams, according to what they told me, is where you have to explain what this code does, regurgitate code, and basically just write down things to memorize. The method assessment does not match with how the field works. This student is a good programmer. He does it the way programming is supposed to be done, by referencing SDKs, by figuring out how things are done. He doesn't memorize. So he is able to create good code. Unfortunately, because the class is assessed in matter of exams, he can't do well. It's not like he doesn't try. It's not like he cannot gain the system. It doesn't work for him. Yes. I, which is why I, I've done hiring for my company, uh, for you know, hiring software developers. I don't care what grade you have. Mm -hmm. I look for two things and two things only. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's your character as a person and give me your portfolio. Sweet. Those are the only two things I care about. What you have grades in, I don't care. Okay. If, you, if you've done a cool project, show it to me as part of getting a grade. I don't care about the grade, show me the project. Okay. That's how I hire you. Is there any other way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That makes sense. I should. No. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So, no, no, I love your points, but let me. I'm hoping to finish it because there's a lot of points going here. We're still a person too. Person two. <laughs> so the outcome here is that we actually have someone who is actually good at what he does, and he was officially recorded on paper by grade as being bad at it. And frankly, if his future was determined solely by his grade, he sunk. And that's why he's angry. He is very good at what he does, he knows that, but he is in a system which consistently told him he is bad at it, and he can't seem to prove otherwise. It just so happens that in my class, he was able to prove it otherwise, because I used projects and real life examples instead of making him do exams. So just to give an epilogue, uh, in this semester, well, he totally changed in my class. There was one moment where, when I was about to start class, he actually asked permission to teach one of my classes. 
And I was thinking, okay, wait a minute. Your parents paid university to pay me to teach class and you want to teach for my class? Yes, <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> didn't tell me, but okay, didn't tell me. <laughs> but frankly, uh, yeah. I did the same thing in university. So okay. We all into programming course because the lecture was too, it was wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What I really love about this was that but two semesters back, he was a very antagonistic character and the students would basically keep it quiet because they just wanted to let the fight go on. But he managed to be someone who volunteered to guide the students, who volunteered to lead the students, and he took on challenges. Like in his third semester, he basically said, I want to do a massive uh, galaxy-based MMORPG game, which is require about uh, 12, me 12 members of the class to work with me. I told him, dude, you've never done project management before, you're going to fail. Are you okay with that? He says, yes. Sweet. And true enough, he didn't do that well in my class because he took a project bigger than he could handle. But to me, that's an education. You try to start a project, you find out how you fail, you understand that it's because of scope, so next time you go smaller. He loved her experience, he was willing to take the deal. So, it's cool. Person went on, he already graduated like about six years ago, and he became one of the most wanted game programmers in the Malaysian games industry. People know him, people want him solely because of his skill. The thing is, okay, what made him awesome was this, and this is what I want to encourage students to have. Number one, what made him good was that he did constant practice. He knew what he wanted to do and he always practiced it. Students joke that he eats code for breakfast. Because he, the first thing he does when he wakes up, he starts coding. Perhaps, nobody really sees him, but he codes all the time. <laughs> and that's what makes him good. And secondly, knowledge of what matters in the field if he chose it. This is a student who has chosen the field and he deliberately went to find out what do I need to know about this on his own. Maybe someone helped him, maybe someone didn't. What matters is that he knew what's important. And number three, I don't know how to teach this, but he has the bouncing spherical object to go against people that do not see things the way he does. The second is knowledge. The third is character. How do you teach character? I don't know, but that's what makes it really, really good. He wasn't the only case. There was a female IT student uh, in the games course who told me she can't program, and she rather just focused on design, specifically game design. So for her final project, I gave her the only exception to do a non-program based game. Because the project is that everyone has to come up with a game and make a report of it. She did a live actual role playing game. <laughs> she basically got uh, people to go into classrooms, pretending to be bartenders, and then to be dungeons, had people in groves going around, and she reported what happened for her final class project. So basically this student knew what she wanted, and she's currently a game designer in Ubisoft. She went to several game companies in Malaysia, went to uh, Ubisoft Singapore, and is about to fly off to Ubisoft France. Basically, she knew what she wanted. Now, I'm sure all of you know Ken Robinson and do his videos. The part that really stuck to me, what I remember, was when he described the dancer. I'm sure you guys some of you remember that. The dancer was a little girl who uh, if she was in the present age, she would be subscribed as being hyper and would be stuffed full of drugs. But back then, someone realized that the person is a dancer, put her in dance school. And what, the thing that scares me was that it describes exactly my experience with the two students. These two students were different. If I didn't know better, I would consider the first person antagonistic, I would consider the second person lazy. But because I realized that they had potential and I knew that they could do something, I managed to bring the potential out of them. I'm not taking credit. I'm just scared of the other students who may not have the chance, who could be good, but because of the system, nobody knows about them. So one thing I deliberately chose to be a lecturer is to intervene. Because to me, coming up with the syllabus, preparing the syllabus, lecturing so on, that's easy. But it's noticing students and understanding why is he doing what he's doing? Why is she doing that? Does she understand? Why does she understand? And if there's a problem, should I intervene? And I consider it a duty and responsibility to intervene if there is a problem. The next person, and why intervention is so important, are the ones not given a clue. 
Not the ones who don't have a clue. I'm okay with those because it's my job to give them a clue. It's the ones not given a clue. And you, we need special attention for them. <laughs> now, classrooms has tribulations and dangers. Among the things that could happen, it really happened to me, was when you fill a whole whiteboard with notes and stuff what it's supposed to know, and you start to wipe it and you realize it's on permanent marker. <laughs> it happens. Never mind. You can't go over that. I'm going to describe a scenario where when, I, when it happened to me, I totally freaked out because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so it was the first gay drama class for second year IT students, similar to the class uh, where I had the anti student. So again, same idea. Six programs get students what to do. Now, I never knew the students. I don't know what the capabilities are. But I have to give them the simplest programming assignment possible. So I decided to do a tax adventure game where all they have to do was basically print text, accept input, yes, no, you want to complicate it, east, west, north, south, forward, give uh, several multiple uh, decisions, and then print out the results. And everyone said, OK, yes, we can do this. And that's fine. It's the first work assignment. Let's give it a test what they need to do. So once they agree with that, I told them, OK, give me an EXE file within two weeks. Should it be a problem? Silence. <laughs> One hand up. Sir, how do you create an EXE file? <laughs> now, for those of you who have not gone through a programming course and don't know what's going on, let me try to explain this. So basically, in every programming language, you have to create programs, you have to submit it to your lecturer, so on. So we put it in floppies from back in the olden days. Now the FTP can email it, but basically the process is still the same after the past 20 years. The thing is, when we write code, okay, the text that we converted into the text machine to run, you need to convert that text into a version a computer would understand. I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but in the end, what you would get is something called an executable or a .exe file. It is the program that you double click on in the folder to run it. The thing is, it is the first thing I learned to do in the first week in university as a CS undergrad. And since the syllabus for IT and CS is the same all over the world, it should be safe to assume that everybody knows how to do that, especially if you're in the second year of an IT program. Did it happen with these guys? I have no idea what happened. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Because here's the thing, if you don't know what the exe file is, number one, you don't understand that computers need to convert code into a language that understands you want the code. Now, that's a technical knowledge, but it's a fundamental understanding of how computers work, how you write code, and then the code has to be transformed into something a computer understands. And once you have that final knowledge, you go to the next step. You learn the difference between compiled and interpreted languages. Sorry, googly gook. The language which can run independently of what kind of machine you run it on, for example, Java. And the thing is, if you don't understand the first part, you're not going to understand the second part. <laughs> and the thing is, if you don't know how to create the XE file, you don't know how to give a program to someone else. And that implies how you're going to make money. When you buy games, you buy software, you buy Microsoft Word, you get software. And if you don't know how to do that, you don't know what the XE file is, how do you give a program to someone? So these are all that should be fundamental questions and fundamental issues. They don't know this. <laughs> Someone forgot to teach the students something very basic about their career. And I, I don't use this word regularly because it's, it's a label. But frankly, if you don't know how to do that, it could cripple their ability to have a future. And that was why I literally freaked out in class, because I didn't know what's going on. <laughs> I communicated uh, with the dean. Uh, no, not the dean. <laughs> uh, with a lecturer who, the IT lecturer who is concerned about the welfare of the IT students. So he went to look for solutions and so on. And after a few months, we figured out what happened. This is how I learned programming. Back in 1994, we basically run through this. It's a very simple UI. It doesn't go through Windows. But this is where you code it. So in around 2005, this is what you use. <laughs> you use Microsoft Visual Studio 2005. It's very similar. You don't need to understand this, but this is what you need to notice. The part where you run a program to see how it works 
is simply that button over there. You press it, if your project is fine, it runs. So, no issues. The problem is actually a UI issue. What happens is that this software, Marcos Visual Studio, emulates running the program for you, it doesn't tell you that it creates it executable. What actually happens is that when you press the play button, the program actually creates the EXE, runs the EXE, but it is invisible. You just see the program running. And if nobody tells you that, you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> the problem here is that the students have learned how to program, they understood the theories and physical programming and so on. When they went to the tutorial, the teacher told them how to use the software, how to get the program running and so on, but they didn't tell them about this, this EXE file. So these capable students never knew about it. So, now, this is why it bothers me. You can say that there is incompetence among the lecturers. Maybe it was an honest mistake. But that's fine. That can be corrected. This is what bothers me. None of the students ever wondered, how do I pass programs to others? <laughs> hey, I'm a visual say, studio. <laughs> you know question, right? Are, are they assuming that, oh, you want to show your program, you should install Microsoft Visual Studio on your machine, oh, you'll pay for it as well, so you can play your program. None of them simply wondered if the process didn't make sense. They are very smart, capable students, but they're acting like <laughs> <laughs> And now the thing is, it is, some of it is not saying so, but we've got to understand them. We've got to wonder, why do students think that way? Because it's a very fundamental problem. What works for me back in my university was something that I call the inner guidance. When I start off programming, a lecturer told us what a programmer is. What he told me was that a programmer is someone who sees a problem, figures out how to solve that problem, breaks down the method into small steps, converts each step into code, and creates the whole code out of it. That's a programmer. And with that guidance, basically our whole work for the next four years university is to figure out how do you break down problems into steps? How do you convert steps into code? If you have different language, what are the terms you use for these particular steps? It's a guidance of what we need to learn. I was actually based in School of Engineering, and engineers have a different inner guidance. There are people who sees a problem, figures out various ways the problem could be solved, and combine the solutions together to solve the problem. They engineer a solution. So with the guidance, similar but not that similar, they would learn differently. The problem I realized for the students is that they were not given a clue. They'll get it if you give them a clue, but they weren't given inner guidance. How do you understand this? What is it you have to learn? What is important for you? If you're ever lost, which way do you go? So the thing that I need to ask is that, do we ever give students a clue? He knows the answer already. <laughs> so here's something that it bothers me. I've seen it happen. In the year 1999, we had the IT revolution in Malaysia, where we basically tell people, OK, everyone, let's go and do IT. <laughs> <laughs> in 2005, it was multimedia. Multimedia was the big thing. Everybody, let's go to multimedia. <laughs> and the thing that really puzzled me is that around 2006, 2010, Everyone was being told to do games. There were a whole bunch of game development courses popping up all over Time Valley. <laughs> so the thing is, I'm sure you know now that there are currently like a few thousand IT students who can't get jobs. <laughs> and for the multimedia students, <laughs> okay, I don't know about uh, jobs, that wasn't announced, but what we know is that a lot of companies that are doing multimedia, they are creating training programs to train students who just graduated, but they need to be retrained on how to do multimedia. <laughs> Which begs the question, how come they don't know how to do it already in the first place with a degree? <laughs> now, my problem uh, with games is that a lot of universities are offering to teach games, but do they actually check with the industries how it works? Who is making sure they know what they're teaching? Who is making sure the students actually know what needs to be done? Because what the problem we encountered in the game industry was that it wasn't there were enough students of graduates. The graduates are not good enough. They're missing fundamental knowledge. They don't have enough practice to actually enter the industry. So the question is, who checked to make sure that they knew? Who told them what they need to know in order to join the industry? I tried to wonder what's going to happen in 2011 onwards. Like what are the new degree programs that ever will go through in the future? Because this actually points out another problem. 
Students are supposed to pick degree programs of their interest. If they want to do it, that's what they do. When you tell a whole nation to go do one thing, <laughs> now let's say they all love it, they do it. <coughs> Can we make sure all of them get jobs? <laughs> we can't, because all of the, you know, like what, 10,000, 20,000 people who wants to get the same job. And we repeat the same process for multimedia, we repeat the same process for games. So every time we do this idea where everyone keep going and do one job, of course you're gonna get people who cannot get a job. Of course the pay is gonna go down because too many people are doing the same thing. So here's another funny thing that happens in university. Sometimes, very rare, sometimes you get undergrads who had working experience. And you actually don't like them. <laughs> they argue. They make a stand. They ask, why are you teaching like this? <laughs> so, one thing that is clear here is that we do have lecturers who are not capable of dealing with issues on an industry level. And if they can't do that, how can you make sure they can teach students to handle the industry outside? If it doesn't even come in and they can't even handle them. <laughs> and the thing is, what I always teach students is that you must always take the time to find information. And you can find information from the various uh, sources. This is Alpha Centauri, a game I played around 1998. And the main thing I read for this game was that last sentence to describe the person. Beware of me who would deny you access to information for in his heart, dream himself your master. And to me, that was an awesome quote. It tells me, always be aware of anyone who doesn't want to give you information because he wants to control you. So what I tell students is to always encourage them to always know more. Now, of course, this is a simple term. You can't tell students that. They're just like, oh yeah, this is nice fate. They're not going to act on it. It has to be very specific. For example, if there's someone who likes geeky debate, you tell them, you need to go to Slashdog. <laughs> go to Slashdog, just go to the debate there, just enjoy the funny quotes and so on. But in the end, he'll be hooked by the contest in there. It's about knowing what kind of student he or she is, what would interest a person. You like concept art? Go to conceptart.org and go through the daily division and so on. So, my job is to figure out if a student is like this, where would he go to have more fun in? And that would encourage them to find out more about their situation. Moving on, the ones who step ahead. Ideally, we want them, but there are some very funny quirk on this. There was one time uh, I was uh, consulted simultaneously by two students. One African student, one Chinese student. That's not them. That's not them. That's not them. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they both asked the same question. Uh, basically, what can we do to make sure that we have a better future? So I asked them one question. It was a question my previous employer asked me, and I thought it was a very good question because it reveals what kind of person you are. The question was, is it better to ask permission or forgiveness? Now, you may have your own personal opinions. Let me tell you what they answered. Both of them answered very confident simultaneously because they knew the answer, they knew it to be true. They said the exact opposite thing. <laughs> <laughs> and once they heard other say that, they really freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, both of them are correct because the question is not about which one is more correct, which one do you actually think correctly? Are you a person who seeks permission? Are you a person who seeks forgiveness? Does anyone understand the distinction between the two? Yes. Follow, okay, good. Now, Malcolm Gladwell, I'm sure you guys have heard of him, yes. wrote several books. My favorite book from here is Outliers, where he talks about how the circumstances determine the success of a person. He talked about Korean Airlines, where at one point, had the worst crash record in history, which is not a good thing for an airline to have. So an analyst went inside, and his solution was make sure the captain speak English. <laughs> it is a very odd solution, but on analysis, what happened was that uh, when you fly a plane, you're in a very critical position. You need to make very quick decisions in case disasters happen. And you need people to tell you if something goes wrong immediately. What was wrong was that the Koreans have a hierarchy. They are an, an Eastern-based society where you defer to the senior and so on. So if your senior is a, pilot, is a captain and he is having trouble, you don't tell him directly something's wrong. You say things like, 
the radar is very useful today. <laughs> and he's supposed to pick up a hint. <laughs> now, the thing is, in Asian culture, it is a very good way to maintain social happiness. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so it has its uses. But there are situations where being polite does not work. <laughs> like flying a plane. <laughs> and many other things. So the thing is, it's a question of authority. It's whether or not the language allows you to have authority in what you're saying or to defer authority to another person. Now, why am I bringing this up? See, the thing is, societies in the past has always built art. I'm taking art as an example for authority. In the East, people built uh, Buddhist statues and Buddhist temples for religion. In the West, people built paintings for God, for Christianity. But come the Renaissance, there was a rule people say people do art not because of God, for Christianity, but for me. You start a culture where I'm important. I'm Leonardo da Vinci, and you're gonna notice my paintings. Now, the thing you have to note is that this is actually a revolution in thinking. It is the creation of an individual. And the Renaissance was the beginning of a kind of thinking where the me is important. And because the Renaissance happened in the West, it did not happen in the rest of the world, the idea of the me only exists in the West and not in the rest of the world. So the thing is, when we create universities, universities are a Western idea. And we have lectures, university lectures, they're also a Western idea. They're based on the idea that we train individuals. Individuals are responsible for their own education, and they can learn because they believe in being themselves. And you bring that forward for a few hundred years so on, we have a number of innovations that's based on the individual. What's an SDK? And SDK is when an individual downloads a program that lets you do things with it. You learn how to use the software, you read the manual, you read to the uh, tutorials, and you learn how to make it work. What is open source? Open source, the idea is where code is open, you can take the code, change it if you want to, and make it your own. What are tutorials? Tutorials are where you literally go out, find out a way to do things, and try it yourself and make it your own. What's a wiki? A wiki is an encyclopedia where you can go and find out stuff, but you can contribute stuff as well. All of these modern innovations has the idea of me, 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 me in mind. So the, the thing is, all these things come to the West, and the West is speaker-centric. The idea where the person itself is responsible to know the material and make other person know the material, which is as opposed to the listener-centric idea where it's the person listening that has responsibility to understand what's going on. So things that come from the West are individual driven, which means any tech, any technology, any programming language, any method, so on that comes from the West, and any solution from that are individual driven. And when things are individual driven, it benefits anyone who goes ahead to do things without waiting for permissions. That's why the distinction of personality is very important. You have the African student and the Chinese student who one of them will seek forgiveness, meaning he will crash to think and say sorry later, and you have another student who will ask permission to do things first. But when you get these kind of technologies, who benefits? The person who crashes ahead. Because he's gonna download the software, he's gonna try it out, he's gonna understand it more, than when someone says, sir, can I try the software first? So this is very important because there are certain fields where we are very Western driven. Now, going on the time for a while. So, we all know passwords, we know encryption. It's the idea where in order to access something, we provide a set of phrases where if you get it correct, you have access. We all know that, we use that. Now, there are people who want to crack passwords, there are people who want to crack encryption. And one method, which is the worst way possible to crack it, is called brute force attack. Where you try to guess the password and change the letter one at a time. It is a very dumb thing to do with your person. It's an okay thing to do with your computer because computers can read processes really, really, really fast. So you just brutally guess, okay, is the password A, 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 No. A, 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 B. A, A, C. A, A, D. And you repeat it. And it's okay for computers because computers are really, really fast. Of course, what people tell you is that you can create complicated passwords which will take you a long time to guess. You can go to the website, how secure is my password? You enter a password, it will tell you, hey, for this password, it will take you 7,000 years for a desktop PC to crack a password. <laughs> so, hey, you have a complicated password, it's safe. You have a complicated encryption, it's safe. But one thing came out around 1990, something called distributed computing. 
where what if, if you, don't, you don't control just one computer, but you control a multitude of computers? What if a whole bunch of computers are trying to crack the same password? So if you have like, say, 4,000 combinations, you get the company A, do uh, 1,000, company B, 1,000, company C, 1,000, and so on. So distributed computing has been used to solve massive problems, like SAPI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where you can download a program, and the program will process a chunk of information to see if there's any extraterrestrial signal. Uh, you can also download a program on the PS3, which is called Folding at Home, which would process a problem regarding folding DNA, and it just downloads a piece and then uploads the results uh, to a server. So imagine hundreds and thousands of computers working on the same problem. What distributed company can do is that it can crack passwords and very difficult problems like this really, really fast. <laughs> so there was an article uh, around two, uh, 2009 where they say they have encryption. All you need is like API performance computers, give it three months, using brute force, the stupidest way possible, and yeah, they'll crack it. So something that used to take thousands of years can be cracked within three months. That's what distributed computing can do. Now, imagine if each of this computer is comparable to a person. Imagine if the work done by one chip, by one computer, is the work of one person. What you have is crowdsourcing, where if you have one problem is being handled one person, that person will lose out to 30 or 50 people working on the same problem. Imagine if this is a lecturer and this is a classroom. <laughs> if a lecturer is worried that the students may know more than him, this is what will happen. Because students crowdsource. They gather together and they talk to each other. Hey, what solution for the problem? On a lower level, they cheat. What they do is, <laughs> students will cheat. You just have to assume that and keep on that. But you can also take advantage of that by giving them assignments that they're required to discuss. Get them to talk to each other. They start sharing information say, I'll look for this, I'll look for that. Come next day, here, this is what I found. found. Multiple by 30 people, maybe they have links to other 30 people, and they can find out more stuff than one expert doing things alone. And there is another development as well. You get West technologies, like setting up intranets. It's easy. Anyone who gets Windows, who gets connected online can do that. It's not that difficult. You can also get WAMP, which is basically a personalized web server, and you can create a web server for your PC. It's easy. Anyone can do it. And when college students living in network campuses get their hands on this, they, by practice, <laughs> they created the internet, but by external intent, they created a dark net. Now, a dark net is an internet that is not easily detectable. Meaning you cannot just Google it, you can just put your URL on it. It's usually just a number that you can only access it if you know it. Typically it's an IP. A true dark net is removed from the internet, but that's for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not relevant here. What's interesting here is that because students have access to very simple technologies, and they figure, hey, I just saw my computer, and he gets online. Hey, I can use this computer. Hey, wait, I can grab his uh, notes from there. And he told the guy, the guy said, hey, hey man, I got some tutorials, I'll put it up here online. And you tell people, hey, I got some videos, I'll put it online, they still have a over the whole night. You live it for a few months, what happens is that they will create their own personal intranet where notes, tutorials, videos, and trees, guides, methods to the software are shared all over the place, and lecturers wouldn't even know it. <laughs> because unless you know the students, they wouldn't even tell you. <laughs> so this is what students did in UCLA in, in 2005. I'm sure they're still doing it. I'm sure they knew ways to do things now, but what we need to know as lecturers was that if you insist on being the authority of someone who knows how to do things, you've got to know how to deal with this. Because these are how students are getting better every day. So the thing is, there are some fields of uh, professional, uh, professional career where darkness totally doesn't work. You can get these apprentices to meet other apprentices on how to make shoes. It's not going to help him at all. Because he will only fix shoes the way the master tells him how to fix shoes. So there are some jobs there where crowdsourcing will not work. <laughs> so these are what we call traditional jobs. So there is a hierarchy. You have a boss who commands managers, who commands seniors, who commands juniors. And basically, anything that changes will depend on who's on top. Then we have non-traditional jobs, which are surprisingly IT credit jobs where one person at the bottom can disrupt everything the people upstairs will do. 
these people can be bosses, CEOs, owners of massive companies, but all it takes is like Graham Cohen to create BitTorrent and suddenly the whole industry has to revamp itself. <laughs> so the thing is, we have to bear in mind that if we're teaching IT and creative jobs, power is based on those who can make things happen. Not among those who tell companies what to do, but those who can create the apps, who run the code, who can executively create the art, and power belongs to the lower on people. Which is why this happened. <laughs> I'm sure many should remember the situation where a lot of IT people were very upset that someone upstairs is trying to tell us what to do with our profession. <laughs> why? It's very simple. The people who actually became good in this field did not need permission to be where they are. They did not need someone upstairs to say, okay, you recognize IT guy. Who the hell are you? <laughs> you become a good IT person by craft, by practice. If there is a professional body that judges you, so be it. But you don't need that body to be really good at what you do. So there is definitely a clash expectations where a government body wants to do it in a traditional way and the actual people doing IT says that that's wrong, that's not the way you do it. So the lesson I tell my students is that the world now, if you're doing a creative IT field, all you need is guts. Smartness can be trained, knowledge can be memorized, but as long as you have the guts to actually go try things, download Educate, uh, try the Unreal SDK, try and do things, they will end up being able to do things. So fundamentally, all you need is the bravery to try things out. Going on to the last person, <laughs> where telling them to be brave does not help. Terrifying <laughs> I was in a lab, I was teaching Photoshop, so they had to go through a two-hour tutorial, and they fulfilled the tutorials in class. So in the end, they showed it to me, I tell them how much grades I got, uh, how much grade they got. So, I have one student who did okay, she, uh, she got like uh, 8.5, and this is one mistake. And it's like about uh, 11, 11.40, she got 20 minutes, I told her, hey, if you sit down and you fix this within 15 minutes, you'll get one, an extra 1.5 points. Her response was absolute terror. <laughs> <laughs> Which didn't make sense to me, but basically it stands for the fact that she didn't know what is the right thing to do. Should she just leave? <laughs> or should he try to get the one for five points? And I think the terror was there. She was thinking like, what if I try to do things and I don't get the points? What if I don't get the whole one for five points? In the end, I figured out that she was actually terrified by the prospect of trying to get that points. And it really leads me to wonder, why are people so scared over points here? <laughs> <laughs> it's simply a very minor thing. And it's just 1.5 points. If you can get an A, uh, it's not going to be jeopardized by 1.5 points. Can it? So here's the thing. This grades work the same way in use all over the world. You get an A, B, C, D, and F, and so on. You do a good job, you get an A. You do an okay job, you get a B. The problem comes when your performance is hidden. In the West, lecturers tell me how I'm doing in the second week of the semester, fourth week of the semester, sixth week of the semester, so I can say, hey, it's in the midterms, I'm getting 50%. I'm doing okay. One guy, I got 70% already. I'm cool. I didn't take an exam. One guy's like, I got 40%. Oh man, I got to focus on this class. The thing about Malaysian classes is that usually lecturers don't tell you how you're doing until the end of the semester. <laughs> Your grades are top secret. <laughs> now, there is a reason for this. Every class, be it the West or the East, uh, is supposed to follow a bell curve. You guys know this? Yes. Okay, so the idea is that hey, in every class, how things should normally go is that there'll be a small bunch of people who gets an A, a good bunch of people who gets a B, a huge bunch of C people, some small D people, and some F people. <laughs> that is supposed to be the natural deviation. In other words, if you have a class, it should fall this way. And that statement will lead people to hell. <laughs> because in Malaysia, what happens is that when you finish your semester, you prepare your grades and so on, and you have to bring to something we usually call the Board of Academics. Yeah. They code your grades. Yep. Now, they can't check on every grade to see what's wrong or not, so they check the simplified version. <laughs> the bell curve, they look like, your curve seems wrong. Why is it wrong? Now, you hope you ask that, but usually they ask you, why don't you correct the bell curve? <laughs> <laughs> now, the problem with correcting the bell curve is that if you tell the students before what the grades are, 
and then you fix the curve, you have to tell them, I'm sorry, your A is now an A minus. <laughs> Imagine you rationed all of that. So what people do is that to avoid trouble, they don't tell students the grades so that when it's corrected, it's as if the students got that grades in the first place. Evil. <laughs> okay. yeah. But that's normal. <laughs> so this no, is the phrase. It, yes? It's common. It's not so normal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's a very difference between the two. Okay. Now here's the phrase that came during the Badawi era. I'm not sure you remember this, but I love this phrase. Can explain this a lot. The little Napoleons. The problem with dealing with grades here is that you have people whose job is to make sure everything is okay. And you come up and show us your grade is a little wrong. Their job is not to figure, hey, what's wrong with your class? Maybe it's just a small number and so on. They're trying to finish like 50 uh, classes in one day. So they just tell you, why don't you just go ahead and change the numbers? Or they give you so much trouble, they say, you have to do this paperwork, you got to be so, so on. This imply that it will be easier if you just make sure the numbers fit the norm. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing with the different opponents is that they have little power. And it's not that they are evil or resentful, it's just that they just want to get their job done. And if you are disruptive, you're an annoyance, and you, you'll give that person and yourself a really bad day. <laughs> so it tends to be easier to just make sure everything's good with the flow. The system is evil. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, uh, I'd love to get back to the point, but let me go through this. Now, the thing is, the refusal to for lecturers to clarify the situation to students doesn't grace a lot of other things, leads to students who are always unsure about their situation. I mean, imagine going to a class where you're not sure how you're doing. That you don't know, am I doing okay? Am I going to fail a class? And that's common. <laughs> it's common for have students who are always worried about getting that 1.5 points because they don't know whether they're going to need it to get an A. Whereas if you reveal the grades beforehand, so you tell them, hey man, you're doing okay, you just do this one assignment and you'll be fine and so on, students will be saying, okay, I'm cool, I can do other things now, I can try things out, I can just skip this class and go to the next one. You give students freedom. When you do this, when you don't clarify the situation, you will get very scared students because they're not sure where they are. Now, there is one situation I remember when I was in the West. Uh, we had to do a physics exam, and it was a multiple choice exam. Uh. The easiest form that you can imagine, oh, no, no, it's freshman, it's freshman class. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, just go through that. So, we, we started the exam, and the lecturer came in, and he said, you know, as I was driving down class uh, for the exam today, I saw this beautiful rainbow, and I thought that was a very nice thing. So, tell you what, if there is any question that you don't know the answer to, just strike it out, and write down, how does a rainbow happen? <laughs> and you give that answer, and if you get it right, I'll give you the mark for that question. <laughs> and I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> the thing is, Western lecturers own their classes and they own their exams. They can change whatever they need, they can fix anything they need. And the problem is, local lecturers don't. They have to follow the system. They cannot just modify exam as they please. They cannot just change a, a question in the middle of exam as they please. They cannot even change things easily about syllabus, whatever they want to. Because they have to follow the system. And when they change, they have to report to the people upstairs. And if they are the kind of people that is seeking permission, it's going to be really, really hard. <laughs> one key distinction, sorry. Uh, there's one time in America, let's say what happens. There was one time where a lecturer told this to us. In the middle of the semester, you guys did so well in the midterm, we have to curve the grade so you get an A, it has to be 97 and above. <laughs> so the whole class just went this. <laughs> and the thing is, yes, we were angry, we were upset for like half an hour for the whole class, but we ended up okay. The thing is, we didn't mind fighting for it. So we knew it's going to be hard, we knew it's not fair, but it was a very clear fight. And in the end, when we win the fight, when someone gets A's or B's, we earn it. And that's what makes us happy. Not the A, not the B, but knowing how much hard we we work to get where we wanted. Yes? So was the grade important or was the fighting important? <laughs> I really wish to this fight. I really do. <laughs> that's why I love the the guys who are not so polite. <laughs> uh, 
So what's important? Okay, back then I was a uh, upperclassman. I thought to me the girl was important. That's why we were fighting for it. <laughs> but in retrospect, now I would say the fighting was important. <laughs> so what I tell students was that don't worry about your grades. I mean, of course they worry because it's not just their problem, it's their parents' problem. <laughs> you have to respect it. <laughs> but basically what uh, I do in class is that I tell them how they're doing the semester, I tell them you're doing okay or not okay, and these are the grades you're going to get. And I give them opportunities to fix their grades. Not by cheating, but by basically telling them here are the things that you need to do in order to actually earn a better grade. And what is important to me is whether or not they went through the process of trying to do those actions. Because I teach game development. It is also a craft. And you can only good at it by doing it more and more often. And if the student doesn't understand something, and they keep repeating the process to try it, I don't mind giving them a grade for that. Because in the end, the grade doesn't matter. Because I know for the companies out there, a 4.0 doesn't matter. They want to say, OK, grade's nice. What's your portfolio? Let's see the games you made. Let's see how well you draw. Let's see how well you program. That matters. So I'm not that concerned about the grade. And I tell it to the students. I tell them how to get a better grade, but it's up to them to decide whether that's important. That's the question? Yep. OK. <laughs> so the thing is, what uh, I realized was that if you create a situation where you don't get feedback, and if you ever in a situation where you do get feedback, that's when you know you're in hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to have an antagonistic boss. <coughs> it's okay to have a pleasant boss. But when your boss doesn't tell you whether you're doing okay, you're doing right, you are in serious trouble. So that's why in lectures, I insist on giving feedback. It's important that you give feedback for students so that they know what's going on. By the way, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but an A in Malaysia, for some reason it's standardized. A lot of universities do this. Is 80 and above. And I find this really odd because you get a situation. You can get a four point student who is only right four out of five times. It's an only 80% success rate, which is not what you expect from a four point student. The thing is, because in the West grades are curved, when you get an A standard is 97 and above, you know you're getting an ace if someone's a 4.0 student. But in Malaysia, you may not get the same thing. <laughs> I mention this because there are companies that insist on getting A students, but they don't seem to understand what the A mean. An A in Malaysia is very different than an A in the West. Now, what could solve the problem? What could solve the problem of having lecturers that is able to say that I own the system, I own the exam, don't tell me what to do? And the simplest thing is actually salt, the salt of experience. A person who is old, who has gone through life, knows what's right and wrong, knows what he's going to fight for, and knows that he's not going to put up with any bullshit that comes from people. So typically, some of the experience will make sure things are run right. But what happens is that sometimes we get very young lecturers. And what happens in universities is that you have very bright students, and you tell them, hey, you're a very smart guy. Why don't you come join our university as a tutor? So at the time of year, age 22, before they actually join the industry and gain more experience, they have to come back and teach students. Which leads to a problem. These people are very smart. They are very capable. But they're not in a position where they have to train others to be smart and capable without developing their own experience. And what typically happens in companies, not just universities, is that you have people, upstairs CEOs, who have good intentions, who have great ideas and so on, <coughs> but their instructions, their directives are passed through little Napoleons, to little Napoleons, to little Napoleons, it goes to the young people who are too young to know that they have to fight back. And because they're young, they experience, they just follow what's going on. It's not just copies as well. Um, me and Buzz, uh, we went attend the MQA board meeting where we actually discussed with MQA people like how do you guys assess syllabus and uh, UC requirements? And in the end, we found it to be very reasonable. They, they told us that basically, what they give out are suggestions. They give guidelines for universities to follow, and universities are allowed to deviate if they want to. But that's their direction. 
pass it down to several layers of management, and what gets back to the people <laughs> creating the syllabus was that you have to follow this. <laughs> Not because it's an actual rule, but because if you do deviate from it, someone has to do the paperwork. It's just so much trouble, let's just not do it. And the younger you are, the more susceptible you are to this situation. Now imagine if this young person is tasked to create a new syllabus, or to create a new course. That's what I had to do. Back in 98, I was asked to create a games course, and I didn't have a lot of experience. I made a lot of mistakes, but I didn't mind that, because I thought, hey, I'm going to pass it to the board, and they're going to fix it, right? Because they know it's, it's, it's just a work done by a 22-year-old. They're going to approve it. They did. <laughs> <laughs> and the course runs, adopted by two faculties who refuses to take responsibility for the students, and that's why I had to step in, because I knew no one took care of the students. That's why I realized that, yes, there's something very funny with the system, and that's why I want to be talk to people, so that people know what's going on. And part of the problem was that we're giving responsibilities of creating new courses, new programs, to young people, because it's easy to tell them what to do. Ideally, when you create a new program, you give yourself the experience, someone who knows that this is right, this is wrong, this is how to prepare it, okay, now the service is ready, we can pass it to people. But many cases, not just mine, there are other new states who are creating game development programs. And you have some guy up there that says, I'm going to create a game development program. And they pass it on to someone down there. That person down there has to figure out how to do it. And if he's lucky, he gets help. If not, well, I know one guy who ran away to France. I know one guy who quit and became a bartender. <laughs> they wanted to create a game course, but in the end, the pressure was too much for them. So this is what I did that actually made a difference. I knew as a tutor that I don't know enough. And I don't want to pretend to students saying that they have to do this, they'll be fine. So what I did was I networked. I deliberately went out to look for game companies and asked, can you tell me how you guys actually do game and so on? I met several people from several industries and they welcomed me. They said, yeah, sure, uh, let's tell you how to do this. I met Brett Baby, I met Karen Sun, I met other industry, industries, and that's how I formed connections with them. And the key thing to this experience is that I was a nobody. All I did was just go out and ask. And what we realized was that throughout the 15 years that I did this, very few universities actually do this. You get a lot of universities that says they want to create a game development course, but you don't meet a lot of them coming up to game company that says, can we talk about how you guys are doing classes? How you guys want syllabus? What kind of people do you need? There is no communication, no clear communication, sorry, between uh, universities and industries. So how do you create a, co a course that's supposed to benefit the industry if no one in university is going out to talk to the industry? So the odd thing to me is that me, as nobody, I go out and talk to industry people, they welcome me. Which means anyone could do it, which means if nobody does it, it's because nobody ever properly tried. And that worries me. So this goes back to the idea of universities being ivory towers. I'm sure you guys heard the phrase. It's the idea that universities are places where you stand high above power, you observe the world and say, oh, that's how the world works. So I tell people that's how the world works. They're not part of the world. They just see the world as a place you can observe. And when you follow this mindset, well, I do a lot of face farming over some of the things that happens. Some examples. There is a, a company uh, called uh, Phoenix Game Studios that created Foam One Online. It was uh, the first mission company to create an MMO. The MMO was uh, uh, sold worldwide, so it was considered, considered a success story. They came to me with a proposition. They would like uh, to give the tools for creating the game and the level editors for free for students to use. So the idea was that they want to get students to practice using the tools so they understand how level editors work so of course, in the end, we still graduate, they have experience with the tools, they can go and join the company. Don't need to mention that. But anyways, the tools are given for free, which uh, for a university, because it's exclusive, it's just, uh, just my university, that's, uh, what is it? It's a great opportunity. So I brought it up to the university. Uh, the university management brought in a lawyer. I sat down with a lawyer, and the lawyer says, they must want something out of this. They must want something out of this. <laughs> like, okay, we'll just do what we need to do. And the lawyer went off, and I waited two weeks, one month, two months, three months, no news. I came back with a company. Uh, any news about this? And what they told me was that the university got back to them and told them, 
uh, we'll be happy to accept your offer, but we want you to give uh, to give us ownership uh, for the program and any results that come out of it. <laughs> so of course the deal is get you. No company will be stupid enough to accept this offer. And you get situation in classes as well, where there was one time there was an exam, and one student uh, was suspected cheating. Actually, not one. There were eight students because one cheat sheet was discovered lying down on the floor, <laughs> and so of course, if the sheet is there, radially anyone right here will be <laughs> So these eight students were left behind there, and a lecturer came up to me and asked me, "Can you go and talk to them?" and try to scare them so that they might admit to cheating. I'm like, what are you to scare students? <laughs> so, that, no, that's not a face problem for me because why do you want to scare students? Okay, fine, you suspect of cheating. I cannot ask them, but I can't force them. I can't make them say they cheat and so on. It's whether or not you can prove it. If you can't prove it, that's all there is to it. So there are many instances where I realize that the way people are treating Students are like some people they're afraid of. There are situations where there was a student who was. Uh, okay, what happened here? All right, uh, she basically skipped class a lot. And she always has an MC. <laughs> they basically said that, okay, I skip class, a, med a medical behavioral doctor. So because the student uh, skipped class so much, she was barred from taking an exam. And, uh, Basically, she came back with her parents to charge that UC was being unfair to her she was being barred because she had a lot of MCs. The lecturers didn't know what to do and until they found that one of the MCs had a wrong date. So it's proof that she faked it. So they would say, oh, thank God that we can prove that she faked it. <laughs> but the thing that bo uh, bothered me is that you get the sense that lecturers are actually afraid of students. <laughs> They're afraid, afraid of parents, students. Hmm? students. Parents. Mm -hmm. Well, in the end, it's the same thing. Why are they afraid of the parents? They have money. <laughs> <laughs> so parents can give the university money, and then upper management can penalize the lecturers and so on. So it's the infrastructure. It's the system, if you want to put it. So you basically have lecturers who are scared. <laughs> Remember the situation? Yeah. So can you say something odd about the situation? It's a girl that uh, got her leg hurt, and we tried to get her to the hospital. So, anything? Make sure that Go on. Make sure face. Oh, what a face. The, the one that's half to marry is female as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the man is bulky and not strong. Man. Yep. And this guy's a boyfriend. He can carry the girl easily. <laughs> they actually asked me, uh, sir, uh, I can carry the girl. The problem is, these guards, they are in the system. They cannot carry the girl. Because they could be penalized for basically carrying a girl. Even though the situation could be considered something fair because you're trying to help a student who is injured uh, to the hospital, but they're more concerned about the situation and how to look to their career instead of taking care of the situation. So the thing is, if lecturers, or take it further, people within university are terrified to deal with your situation, how do you teach students to deal with students' own fears? You want to teach students to be able to take on the world, to be world champions. But if you yourself cannot deal with your own fears, how are you going to teach students to be able to do the same thing? So there was a man uh, named Noriko Hirino. Uh, he is uh, a composer from Jump Impact. He formed a branch of his uh, music company in Malaysia. Uh, okay, you can't see the text easily, but basically, when he studied the market in Malaysia, he says the biggest problem in Malaysia is trust. People don't trust each other in Malaysia. People are scared of each other in Malaysia. So it seems to me that being a Malaysian means that you have a lot of fun, <laughs> fear, uncertainty, and doubt where you have a lot of people telling you you should be afraid of certain things and that you're not certain of certain things you get information and you're not sure what's going on. And the thing is, when you live in fun, it affects you. It makes you less smart, less capable, less brave because you're always afraid of what is going on. And of course, it's the Western society that would say, this is fun, fight the fun. Fight the fear, uncertainty and doubt because if you can get over this, you will be a better person. 
And here is a talk that really inspired me. This is Jay Matarigal, who did a talk about gamers. And she talked about how gamers are great. Well, it's actually a problem for her, because people say gamers are great in what? They're great at playing games. <laughs> She's a researcher at MIT, and she has to figure out what is it that makes gamers good. These are the four things that she says are why gamers are awesome. They're good at being uh, being productive and being happy about it, because people are happy playing games. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's funny you say that, but she actually has a very serious point. They are good at forming clans, uh, forming people who leverage together, so they're good at creating social fabric. They are urgent optimists, where you give it a problem and say, OK, let's win this quest, and I'll get all those XP. <laughs> and uh, they put epic meaning in whatever they do. When given a task, they say, like, oh, this is important to me. This is my quest. I must win it. It's very silly when you put it in real life context. But she flipped it by saying that instead of having this, you could have this. You have people who are not urgent optimists, people who think that they cannot do anything, people who don't feel like their life has meaning. So when you compare this with this, which is better? Gamers may be people who are dealing with virtual world, but at least they know what it means to win. They're going through systems, be it virtual, that teach them what it means to fight, <coughs> what it means to work with friends, what it means to win. And consider this, consider that generally, this is what youths go to all the world. They go to description, they think like, I'm not good at this. They go to classrooms and class will tell them, okay, uh, you'll be graded for number one, number 40. And only one person can be number one. So the rest of the others did not win. This continues in real life where you have competitions where uh, if you join a play competition and you did not get this one point uh, to beat another to score, you're a loser. I've just competed like that, where basically you need to pick like five winners out of 15, and the sixth person only misses out by about two or three points. And unfortunately, because they didn't make it, the winners are fitted, the losers are ignored. So what she's pointing out here is that the good thing about living a gamer's life is that you are training people to feel good about working hard and winning and giving meaning to your life, as opposed to in real life, which actually has problems. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> what I teach students is that do not indulge in your fears, acknowledge it, but go ahead and try to do what you want to do. And in the end, that's important, because once they get over the fears, then they are willing to do things without asking for permission then they are willing to explore the technologies that come in their way and they can try to form their own opinions, their own actions, and try to do their own things. In summary, what would I say to summary this presentation is that educating is very simple. It's just as simple as empowering them to believe in the ability to educate themselves. I don't need to give them information. They can get it from the internet. I don't need to give them a syllabus. What I need to tell students is that, hey, there is a method here for you to learn. If you believe that you can learn this, you can apply it, and you constantly do it, you will learn something. And I will tell you how far you've learned. You trust me on this, I'll guide you all the way. And that's it. And ladies and gentlemen, that is my talk for this. Thank you, ladies. Awesome.